Um, but it's great to be here. It's great to be back here because I spent 10 years at the University of Alberta. It was my first academic position. And a lot of what I, um, a lot of what I do now was formed during that period. So it's exciting to be back and see a few familiar faces and meet a lot of new ones. Uh, so one of the graduate students um, at lunch asked me um, how I came to do what I do. And it took about an hour and a half for me to answer that, so I'm not going to go into that today. But Anne is right. I do focus a lot on conceptual issues around restoration, policy dimensions. But I'm especially interested in historical ecology these days and the role of history and historical knowledge in a rapidly changing world. So I'm going to speak about some of those themes today. I have a lot of people to thank before I get going. This work that I talk about today um, depends on an awful lot of people who have helped and inspired me recently. My students and colleagues, of course, in the School of Environmental Studies. Colleagues in a loosely affiliated group of people um, I've been working with the last couple of years interested in emerging ecosystems, novel ecosystems. And I thank, in particular, <coughs> Richard Hobbs, Carol Hall, Jim Harris, and Steve Murphy. I'm also grateful for funding support that's carried on the research that I do and my students do. And that's come in part from the Alberta government through the Environment and Sustainable Resources Development Ministry and from federal sources such as the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. So, ecological restoration. I'm going to speak mostly about restoration today. I'm going to dip my toe into reclamation. But one of the things that I'm here to do, and I've been able to benefit from conversations already today, is learn more about how reclamation is playing out both in an academic form and practically out in the landscape. So I'm certainly going to talk a little bit about land reclamation and where these two intersect. And one of the things that I've been fascinated by is how little treatment there is about the intersection of these two. There's actually not a lot of formal discussion in the literature about how reclamation and restoration function together, whether they're distinct, if they are, um, how are they connected, if they're not distinct, are they on a continuum, what does that continuum look like, and does it matter actually, but I guess it matters to me because I'm sort of a philosopher, so I'll make it matter. I'm also interested, in, and I'm going to talk about rapid change and novel ecosystems. Well, that's a big theme of what I want to discuss today. And then how it is that we look at moving forward when we bring these three elements together. So finally, I'm going to speak about responsible intervention. So in the future, how do we intervene responsibly in ecosystems undergoing rapid change? I think it's a tough question. Now, Seems to be a lot of preamble here. Let me do one more thing. So, small world moments. Back in, is Sarah Wilkinson here? When was it that I joined your master's committee? Was it 99, or was it? 98. 98, yeah. Sarah did a master's degree with Ann Nath, and, um, but focused on the Galapagos. It was so fascinating. Why, you know, your study of invasive um, species down in the Galapagos. You know, and fast forward, I co-hosted a meeting a couple of years ago out in British Columbia on novel ecosystems, and I meet this guy from the Charles Darwin Res Research Foundation, Mark Gardner, and uh, we start talking and realize that he must know Sarah. So I said, yeah, I was, I can't quite remember Sarah's name because I was having one of those moments. And he said, oh, you must meet Sarah Wilkinson, of course. And so I'm going to start with a slide that's courtesy of Mark Gardner and his his uh, partner, Mandy Truman, from their work in the Galapagos Islands, where they were dealing with this. This will look familiar to you, Sarah. Um, uh, on Santa Cruz Island in the Galapagos, um, management of the humid highlands has taken uh, a different trajectory than what might have been expected from a purely restoration point of view. I'll oversimplify the story. If Mark were here or Sarah were standing up here, they could make the story a lot more complicated. But in effect, this ecosystem underwent a regime change 
from a shrubland system to a forested system, as you see in the photograph here. And it was driven, a combination of factors, but the dominant ones were the invasion of a tree species, um, the, um, it's the red quinine, is that right? The, it's the quinine species, and the black rat. And the, inter the interaction of these two species led to a major sh ecological shift in this system. And Mark labored under an administrative setting and a management setting with the Charles Darwin Research Foundation that said, you must restore this ecosystem. You must bring it back to what it looked like when Darwin stepped foot on these islands in the 1830s. And Mark worked really, really hard, and it couldn't be done, and at least in any practical way. One of the things that they ended up doing, Mark, Mandy, and others working, was to come up with a, zo a zonal approach where each of these zones represents a different kind of treatment in which experiments were being taken. In one place, the, the quinine trees were eradicated. In another place, the rats were eradicated. Created. They had control areas. In an attempt to, to try to work out whether you could do restoration, which they found out wasn't really practically possible, and if not restoration, then what kind of intervention makes sense when you have species mixing, species invasion going on, that kind of driver, climate-related issues, and cultural practices and economic overlays that were compelling these systems away from traditional restoration. So what could you do in terms of biodiversity measures and ecosystem function that would make sense? Mark has moved on from his work in the Galapagos, partly because the collision of those two worldviews um, wasn't productive in the end. This system isn't likely to be restored. And so what do you do? What's the, you know, what path do you follow? And in part, that's what I want to look at. That's what I'm fascinated by these days. It's just one example among hundreds, thousands that we're seeing worldwide. I asked this question back in 1997 in a paper, um, and it generated a good deal of controversy, because what I was trying to ask at the time was, we know technically and scientifically speaking what good restoration is. Well, that's arguable too, but we can kind of get answers to that. But I was interested in what happened when we started to add economic and cultural and aesthetic and ethical measures to restoration. How do we know what good restoration is? And that question has, um, you know, I've, been, I've fed on that question for a number of years, resulted in a book <coughs> called Nature by Design, in which I argued that restoration comprises not just the common elements of, that we think of with restoration, like ecological integrity and historical fidelity, but also is fundamentally defined by how people engage with those ecosystems and what kind of design that we engage in when we're doing restoration. Because every time we restore an ecosystem, and I think this is true, that every time you try to reclaim an ecosystem, you are imprinting some aspect of your value system on that ecosystem. No matter how well-dressed it is in the scientific and technical ideas. And so the question is what, what that looks like. But what I've more recently, in the last three or four years, the question has shifted for me. And I'm now a lot more interested in what is responsible intervention slash restoration in novel ecosystems, that is, new ecosystems that are emerging, and those that are undergoing rapid change. So I think this is an update on that question that I asked 15 years ago. And, uh, but really trying to get at this question of, of dynamism and rapid directional change. So a bit of background on restoration. Although I'm sure m most of you are well acquainted. Here's the definition from the Society for Ecological Restoration, the gold standard definition, if you will. The International Society says that it's the process of assisting the recovery of an, of eco of an ecosystem that's been damaged, degraded, or destroyed. A restoration, when I got involved 
when I first met Anne, um, let's just say it was some number of years ago, restoration was a kind of marginal practice. It wasn't well um, accepted by government organizations and or in the private sector. It was largely community driven, so small projects and lots of them. And organizations like the Society for Ecological Restoration were just getting going. Educational programs were just forming, and the literature really hadn't coalesced. But if you fast forward 20 years, a lot has happened. And we see that restoration is beginning to take a global stage in terms of its priority. So one example of that is this report that came out from the United Nations Environment Program in 2010. And this, if there was a, sort of a debut ball for restoration, this was probably it internationally. And Canadians have played a strikingly important role in this. So Karen Keenley's side, who is the uh, responsible for restoration um, in Ottawa for Parks Canada, uh, helped to get a group of people together internationally to produce a set of principles and guidelines that would govern how restoration played out in national parks and protected areas in Canada. And this document, released in 2007, was um, important to those working on the ground when we actually had people working on the ground in Parks Canada. That's another story. Um, and then, in an intriguing twist on the tale, Karen's boss at one time, Nick Lockheed, became the chair of the World Commission on Protected Areas, so the global organization that uh, oversees um, or provides a continuity and support for protected areas management globally. Commission Karen, oh, sorry, before I go on to that, but just to mention that one of the defining features of this report and what was so important about it, I think, was that it said restoration had to have three qualities to, 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 be, to work well. The first was it needed to be effective. So if you restore something, you need to meet your objectives. The second was you needed to do it in a way that was efficient, however you, however you measured efficiency. And finally, it had to be engaging. You, need to, you needed to achieve public support, but public participation in the process of restoration. And these three concepts underpin the Canadian approach. And that's what led to this document from IUCN through the World Commission on Protected Areas that was released in Jeju, Korea last October. And this document, I think, is a game changer. I, it's partly a game changer because in it, not only I think it's an elegant and you know, sort of internationally negotiated set of principles and guidelines around restoration, the first of its kind, really. But also, it acknowledges that ecosystems are changing and that we need to adapt our approaches to restoration to make sense of this. So I think it's a really important document. Easily available as a download if you haven't seen it. But restoration is changing in so many ways, and there are a lot of drivers. I was doing a survey course on restoration last fall and I started to identify some of the key drivers that have affected change. So if you were to, if you were to enter a time machine, go back a decade to 2003, what's changed in the last decade? Well, engagement. So participation and the acknowledgement that um, people's involvement in restoration practice is critical. In an article forthcoming in restoration ecology, um, a meta-analysis of uh, uh, a database of restoration projects worldwide showed that more than 50% feature community engagement. Secondly, a rec recognition that the made in North America model of restoration that anchors in pristine wilderness doesn't make sense if you live in Europe. It makes less sense if you live in most parts of the global south. And so being able to look at the different cultural approaches to restoration allows restoration to be nimble and flexible. And that's one of the things that the um, that WCPA report did very effectively. Third, we're starting to, um, since 2006, arguably a little bit earlier, but mostly since 2006, we've seen people toying around with ideas of 
novelty, that is ecosystems that are new to us, that we haven't seen historically before. We've had audacious proposals, things like rewilding, Pleistocene rewilding, or in this particular case, this was from um, an article in Science uh, last year in which uh, there's this uh, you know, road sign for you know, elephant crossing in the background of uh, Ayers Rock. So big, audacious programs you know, asking questions, profound questions about time scale and how much intervention we should play. Assisted migration, big programs going on. I'm less familiar with what's going on with assisted migration in Alberta. I might be fascinated to learn more. I'm a little bit more aware of what's going on with forested systems in British Columbia and looks at, um, and uh, serious looks at assisted migration, including in Gary Oak ecosystems. And finally, invasive species. But an acknowledgement of the power of species mixing, of species invasion, is a defining point in restoration and trying to come to terms with what we do, what's appropriate. So let's go back to the definition, but let's, for a moment, look at what's on the other side of the line with reclamation. And I was speaking with the graduate students at lunch, and I just had one of those awful moments I think might be coming where someone will say, you've missed the obvious definition. But I don't, I'm not aware of a kind of globally recognized definition. There are a lot of definitions of reclamation floating out there. Many of them overlap and have similarities. And I chose the one um, from um, Alberta ESRD. Process of reconverting disturbed land to its former use or other productive uses. And in brackets, equivalent land capability, which is a kind of important clause. So I'd ask you to think for the moment, don't get too distracted, but think a little bit about what the relationship is between these two. Is it obvious? Can we make a strong line? Are they basically the same thing? How do they differ? Well, I started to ask that question in preparing for this lecture. And uh, so here I am. I've just crawled out on the branch, and I'm getting towards the thin end of the branch. But let me try it. So we'll compare the two along a series of factors. So let's look at, first of all, the goal. The goal of reclamation seems to be strongly functional. So when you're trying to, when uh, two of the graduate students are working up at Divik on um, uh, what I understand to be a kind of a scraped um, uh, now gravel site, is that right? Have I got that right? More or less, kind of, sort of. So the goal there is the recovery of some eco ecological function, some productive function. Is that right? I don't know how clearly the goal is defined, and you haven't yet finished your proposals. So, But I would say that the just clear difference between functional and in restoration, the emphasis has been in the past on compositional attributes. So compositional goals. How can we get it to resemble more or less what it was like prior to some clear disturbance event? The idea of historical knowledge or historicity, the quality of being historical. When we process that, through re process that through reclamation and restoration, we see that in reclamation, I think the role of history is peripheral. It's not non-existent. But I don't think combing historical records to see what the ecosystem was like prior to being um, put through some kind of industrial process is a big part of reclamation. But it typically is a critical part of restoration. Although it's arguable, things are changing. We'll come back to that. Now, in terms of the driver, like what's pushing reclamation, I'd say that it's largely top down. And it's being governed. And see, I'm just, I know people are going to say that there are lots of exceptions. But I think reclamation is being driven um, substantially by private sector needs operating under a regulatory environment. That's what's driving. This is pretty top down. You don't have, you know, community groups in McKernan saying, "Hey, let's reclaim," or at least not so much. But with restoration, you see a lot of bottom-up impetus. A lot of drive for restoration is coming from at the community level. Everything from 
schoolyard projects to engage students in restoration to the Bowker Creek watershed project in downtown Victoria to the Gary Oak ecosystem recovery <coughs> teams and work on restoring the imperiled Gary Oak ecosystems in greater Victoria and so on. Those are examples from home. So that's kind of how, how I see it. Again, exceptions. And then intention, I think the, with reclamation, the intention is typically human-centered. So it's about meeting regulatory requirements, and it's also about getting land back to some kind of equivalent capacity, productive capacity. And with restoration, it's predominantly ecosystem-centered. So if I were to pause now and get you to comment on this, I suspect you know, I'd be having you know, snowballs thrown at me. But it, I, this is just a first crack at how to kind of parse these out. I hope it makes sense. We can come back to it later. I want to turn briefly to work that's been very influential in my thinking about ecosystem dynamics and historical change, and that's been the Mountain Legacy Project. Anne mentioned it kindly in her introduction. It's a project that wasn't just in the past, it continues now. It's great to see Joyce Gould here, who's been a part of um, the Mountain Legacy Project and supporting it. And, um, uh, this really had a big, the project continues to be very much um, um, an Alberta project because we're working in the mountains of Alberta, except for this first slide, which was taken last year in the Yukon. And this um, is a photograph of me over the terminus of the Casca Walsh Glacier, an 80 kilometer long glacier. If this glacier existed in Jasper National Park, it would run from the Columbia ice fields to the town of Jasper. The scale is monumental. It's just hard to comprehend. It was a great privilege to be up there last year working with Luke Copland from the University of Ottawa, a glaciologist who's studying the dynamics of uh, these glacial features. This is the Kaskawulsh as it looked to um, J.J. MacArthur, a photographic land surveyor working with the Dominion Topographic Survey in 1900. So he stood on the same place I had the pleasure of standing on last summer, about 112 years earlier. And this is what that glacier, that's what happened to the glacier over the intervening period. And pay attention to this trim line, particularly on that cliff face. The glacier actually extends the, the terminus a little further down, a little out of the picture. These, uh, this same story can be told, of course, throughout the, the eastern slopes, the Rockies from the glacial source outwards, and it's been a very prominent story around glacial retreat. And, uh, you know, we, almost certainly a consequence of changes in precipitation and, and temperature. We began this work because of the extraordinary efforts of historical surveyors who deployed a Made in Canada technique to use photographs to create the first topographic maps. Of this mountainous area of Western Canada includes lots of Alberta, the mountainous region of Alberta, British Columbia, and Yukon. And we went back, this is last summer, this is a graduate student, Jenna Falk, um, and we've been repeating these images at a steady pace over the last 15 years and got quite a collection and this uh, composited comparison from Wilmore Wilderness. You can see, I hope you can see, um, changes in vegetation pattern. In fact, when you look closely at these images, a lot is revealed about shifts in vegetation pattern and human activity and a host of other features that people are interested in. So the photographs have been a gold mine, in a sense, for, for trying to understand how systems change. What's becoming more apparent to us, though, is directional climate-induced changes. And a student of mine, Will Rausch, a couple of years ago, an inveterate climber, fantastic mountaineer, um, he was in Kootenai National Park on a hiking trip and noticed that the Alpine Larch communities up near Good Seer Pass, this area here, looking north towards Yoho, so just on the other side of the Continental Divide, had a phenomenal rate of increase in the tree line ecotone. 
And so that's where he drew it, more or less. Of course, those of you who know tree line ecotones, you know they're not really a line, but a gradient. But that's where he drew it in 1906. That's where, well, he didn't draw it. Yeah, drew it later, not 1906. That's where the line appears in the photograph in the past. And that's what's happened to it. So you can see big changes here, not only in terms of the tree line, which has moved to the top of the ridge, but you can see a real shift in community composition, mostly larch, alpine larch. So fantastic shifts. And Will's commitment to um, backcountry skiing, I mean research, allowed him to go and do some winter ecology as well. And combining the two together, he was able to show pretty conclusively that this change in composition was not being driven from the bottom up, not a components level forcing of the system, but in fact um, coming as a consequence of changes in climate. So the tree establishment was following the same pulse as the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. So that was really fascinating work. So here we start to see how we use these photographs to, to make um, um, observations about the qualities of these changes and the causes of the changes. And we've been following this up. Um, I, who am not um, particularly savvy with computers, have, am engaged in a collaborative project with computer scientists, which is terrifying. But it's just, um, we're looking um, at how we can classify images so that we can um, start to look more precisely at what's going on. And Chris Stockdale, who's a graduate student here at the University of Alberta, I help with um, his project. He's working with Alan McDonald. Chris is um, pursuing a different line of inquiry, looking at rectification of these images to be able to do precise sorts of measurements of landscape features. So the image is being used in lots of different ways. And I could talk forever about this, so I'm going to stop. Just to say, these are the historical maps. That's why we create. That's why the collections were created. It's the largest systematic mountain photography collection in the world. 140,000 images, all laid down on 4 by 5 inch glass plates. Spectacular collection. Most of them in Ottawa, quite a few in, in Victoria and the provincial archives. And we've repeated about 5,000 pairs. So, so we have a, a large collection of these images. And I mention this mostly to invite you, if you have any interest at all, please see me. Very happy to share and collaborate on this.